right? So we are going to look at um, the control for noise, and I said this I thought could have been um, could have been easily discussed. I had given it last week when I said that students could think about maybe um, ten ways to reduce noise, and that's what this first probably 50 slides have in it anyway, right? So I'm not going to read or even um, touch any piece of this piece that's specific, right? We could just look at the headings that, you know, what you already need here is something like a hierarchical approach. So you want to be able to reduce noise at the source. And again, the other methods you'll have, you know, the engineering control, all of that, the word they use is attenuation. The word attenuation means to reduce. So attenuation and transmission, reduce the transmission of noise before it reaches the employee. So, um, you know, I think, um, I'm not sure if you want to help me with this, but I was going to try to count it, you know, like on, see if you can come up with the 10 anyway, right? I count it in your fingers. One way is distance. Keep the distance away from the noise source, right? Um, so that's two ways, right? Uh, in fact, the, I think I told you this before, I'm not too sure if it's this class, there's a little acronym to remember all of this. The acronym is kind of catchy. Um, of course, the real, the real thing is moving catchy. So that's me, right? <laughs> STDs, uh, and the S is shielding. So a shielding is like a barrier, right? So STD. Time to reduce the time. Shield time is the chances right here. You see, so that's a four. You have a minute device to shield in isolation. All of this is all shield in. I said I'll kind of just discuss this. We're going to talk about noise as well as control of the receiver, basically, is in the form of two main means. So I'm not sure how much fingers are to. That could have been about maybe seven here. You had maintenance, you have elimination, uh, shielding, time, distance. You have. Um, Administrative control is five, and this could be the use of noise havens and the use of hearing protection. So that's about seven. All right, so a noise haven is like an enclosed room, right? So a noise haven, a nice answer to say. The use of hearing protection, everybody should know. And then this lesson goes into a lot of um, hearing protection, right? Um, of which, to me, you don't have to know any of them, right? But I mean, like, know them by heart. Right? What it happened is just different types of air plugs and air defenders and what they made out of. And Nibos should really ask you a question like that. It's more like a control question anyway. So um, it's nice if you know them by name. They talk about the noise haven here, which is like an enclosed room. Um, different types of air plugs and air defenders. I think the most, the most that you have to say here is that in selecting an air defender, you need to consider an octave band analysis. That's all we have seen. And I'll tell you, if it, if it wasn't in that session, what it means is that the manufacturers would normally have an octave band on the specifications. If you did an octave band analysis, you just have to click on the product and click on the octave band and it just measure up the two of them and see if that octave band is similar to the one you had got on your company site. And then you know that that air defender then is good for that level of noise. Right. So I, I did read this, um, you know, I did write this many years ago, but um, when I was back in PAL anyway, right? Um, but, you know, to, to me, there was, there was nothing there other than what people already know, airplugs, disposable, reusable. So it's a nice read, right? And I mean, all of it just talks about, it's just one form of control, which is airplugs and air defenders, right? You see passive air protection on top, there's actually something called active and active air protection would actually cancel out the noise, right? Um, so most of what we have is what we call passive, it's just like the air defender, the cups then that fit over the air. But if you're using something called an active air protection, it is an air defender. Again, you have to check the, check the specifications for, for them though, but they would be able to cancel out the noise, right? They do something inside of them then, right? They send out a frequency. Um, a nice way to think about this, I know I used this illustration before for the last class, is like you think about a ripple, like if you, like if you were to toss a pebble uh, into a lake, you'd see a ripple, but if you toss another pebble, you'll see another ripple interfering with that first ripple. That's what mm -hmm. those active protection does anyway, right? One frequency cancels all the other frequency, right? So if you want two answers out of PPE, you can 
well, maybe three, you can probably say passive air protection, and then you could say active air protection. You can read it from the slides when you get to it anyway, right? All of these reusable airplugs, all of this advantages, advantages. Um, I, I don't think this is really a question for unit B, um, you know, because unit B is more like biological agents. Unit C is actually workplace equipment. So they talk about advantages and disadvantages. But we all should know advantages and disadvantages. Maybe there's one or two. The main, the main advantage I think of um, things like airplugs is that it does not, you know, interfere with the other type of PPE. It does not be spectacle wearers. Some speech. It doesn't get airflow. So sometimes it's not easily seen. Um, it wasn't so busy. So I was standing up uh, looking at some workers. And this is just after, you know, we had the PE drive anyway. And when I looked at the worker, to me, I thought he did not have his air plugs, right? I went downstairs, they're hot and sweaty. And only when I reached him, I realized that he had it on. So it's not easily seen. You know? So um, it's a nice one. Again, based on manufacturing and stuff. Um, he wouldn't go too much into this anyway, right? So air muffs, they want to fit the air. The advantages, definitely, it will tend to attenuate noise or reduce noise more than an air plug. Right? Yeah. The main disadvantage, it will not be compatible. You have to we can show you a pit, I guess, if you have one. Anyway, then you have to have one that had glasses. I mean, all of those, they really call out incompatibility between PPE. Um, once you are wearing a spectacle, a glasses, and you, you some, you know, some use of it would have been lost because it's not really fitting on the side of it. It would be resting of the glasses, right? The disadvantages of um, air defenders, right? So expensive takes a lot of people. Uh, if the person is wearing spectacles, if you have excessive, I guess, facial speech communication problems. Um, however, do like I said, I don't see this as a unit B question. This is more unit. C, workplace and work equipment. So feel free to read it and move right along, right? Um, so I said the only thing really good here for unit B is the second point. Should not be chosen simply on the basis of, I have to just get the pieces out today, right? On the basis of attenuation to safeguard against a given DBA, song level measurement. Composition of the noise spectrum should be considered um, in the octave band analysis. Right, so just remember if um if you didn't do that, I really wanted to do it. Right, I didn't get a chance to do it though. But I said um that octave band thing was really nice. I had just gone on Google, I think it was Amazon, um pull on a, a air defender, just look at the specs on it, and just just like under the specification, under the picture of the air defender, you have some little buttons to press. And one of them was an octave band analysis, right? So just in case, um, again, if you missed last week too, I mentioned, um, if you missed last week, I mentioned that if you go on the Google, no, not the Google, so the App Store, I guess the, the App Store on your phone and your normal smoke on your normal phones, you could um, just search, was it NIOSH, right? N-I-O-S-H, NIOSH approved. Um, noise meter and you can download it on your phone. And what that is, NIOSH, which is the American, you know, standards anyway, created an app to turn your phone into a noise meter. And if you had that, I'll share with the class that I had one that could have done the octave band analysis. It's just a function to press. It's like a calculator that could do um, what you call second function calculator. It's like a little green button on the calculator on an on a noise monitor, right? You just have to press that button and it would go into what they call octave band analysis. The difference, if, if you miss those classes, the, the, the difference is that when the sound level meter will monitor, then what it's monitoring really is what we call the intensity of sound, right? But when you put it in the octave function, it's actually monitoring the frequency of sound, right? So when you get um, a measurement of 80 decibel, that is the intensity of sound from the very first class we had. And then if you switch the function into the octave band range, then you start to measure the frequency of sound, right? Anyway, that's what they use to select PPE anyway. And most manufacturers have an octave band graph, right, or the specification of the products. I mentioned that here. That was very practical and how you could use an octave band 
to see like a type of PPE, right? Um, this is just talking about which type of air protection would reduce, you know, noise the most. And if you look at it, um, well, they all have dark lines though, so there's no really way of differentiating it. But you have A, I would suppose the first one is, um, I probably want to say maybe this one is A, the M of the one is the most. Then you have the expandable the foam, the air plug. The gas is cutting, you just put in your air gas in there. What they want to do the M of the one is the gas cutting. That could be sort of like cutting that air, right? So, um, I would skip this. This is all, guess, all about the final way on to the journey. Right? Let's take a look at the time. So that wasn't too bad. All right. Um, so just, just to summarize that there, um, uh, in case you really want to do a good noise question, you should try to come up with 10 ways to reduce noise, right? Um, so, you know, I think the other lesson had some ways on it as well. You have ways like reducing absorption, reflection, transmission, really all of those is really engineering controls anyway, different types of materials to put around the room, right? Or the noise source anyway, right? Time distance shielding is golden. You can remember that elimination, engineering control, administrative control, uh, PPE and the different types of them anyway, right? But a good idea is to get your hands on a pass paper, which I don't have one here like that. But get your hands on a pass paper, maybe an old one that they had done it really well, and see if they have in it 10 ways. We already have about seven or eight there, right? Ways to reduce noise and, um, you know, do that question because uh, that could be, but it's, it's a good thinking question in that I think it could still, you know, brainstorm it if you were, you know, press to come up with two additional answers. You can still brainstorm two other ways to reduce noise, right? So I'd use the same. Um, no, I had a passive but to show you and mentioned that to you last week. So let me go and try to find that. Um, there was something I was saying last week with the calculations that um, I needed us to do, right? Um, so I have two to show you. I have to just want to find that one. Right. Um, so you can take this. I know it wouldn't come up as it. I have to get it on my side, right? Um, there was one in 2016, and there's a calculation in it, but it's not the normal calculation as what we did last week anyway, right? So let me try to take and bring this up and see how fast we can do this, right? Um, this piece of it, right, um, I had to try to find it in your book. And it's like on the last page with noise, right? So if we could, as this still loaded here, there was just one tiny little paragraph with this, right? Um, the last page in your book with noise, if you don't have a book on you now, you can just probably take a note of it. Um, noise, 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 right? Um, page 186, right? And um, I don't know if I can find it better for you there. Right, um, you'd have to look there, right? I think I saw it there. This is one tiny paragraph on it, um, and Nibosh created a whole question out of that, right? I'm gonna say I could try not and share that with you now, um, right? So, see if you taking a look at this one. This is, um, you all see in July 2016, yeah, yes, okay. Let me just try to bring it up. That's one. Shot big. I know something said the folks when you look back at it on the um, recording. Right? It needs to be clear for everybody. Right. So um, it's in section B. So we're going to have to go down a bit. Right? Um, 2016 is the year. And I was trying to find an exact line for you, but I wasn't able to. But I suppose once I cover it, you'll see what I'm talking about, right? Um, Right, so it's number, right, it's number nine, right? Um, so we could see how fast you could do the first piece. The first piece is an audiogram. The second piece I'm telling you is a full. I saw 
they mentioned it in words, um, but however, though the formula was in the guidance, the L108, um, I did, didn't read it for this week, I read it last week, but I suppose it would be in part six of the guidance, right? The guidance is an arm. If you go to the table of contents, you can find it there, right? Or hopefully it's in part six because part six is what talks about measurement. Anyway, um, they say here, um, so we did this piece already anyway, and this is a piece of audiometry, right? So audiometric testing can form part of a hearing con conservation program, outline circumstances in which audiometric testing should be carried out, and that's two marks, right? Um, so I'll just give you the answer. You could, of course, you know, let it when we say it back, and then we're going to post this on YouTube anyway, right? But the circumstances I mentioned last week, it is basically when, um, when you do your testing, um, I suppose even not doing your testing, but it, you could have done, I guess, uh, the static testing. And, you know, you, you would have gotten a value around um, 85 decibel, right? Mm -hmm. I, I suppose it could be other reasons. The reason I say is it, it could have been complaints. Yeah, a legal requirement. Yeah, 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 yeah. And as I said, it is a legal requirement. It's under Regulations 9. I mentioned that to you a lot on the video last week. If you listen back to the hear me saying that, that once you get around 85 decibel, it's now a legal requirement to do a noise survey or noise surveillance. And noise surveillance. surveillance and, and yeah. And the audiometric testing is the first part of that, that surveillance. What I was saying, I mean, for two marks, I mean, there could be more reason. It could have been that complaints workers may have complained, you know, about um, sound and whatever have you, right? But basically, that's what you want to get. You want to get into the regulation here. Anyway, not saying too much of that because I want to go to the calculation part B. Online benefits of audiometry as part of a hearing conservation program formats. So you could have a look at that. Uh, maybe the main benefit I tell you is that you will be able to track what is happening with a worker um, you know, in terms of hearing loss, right? I mean, you're looking at a typical audiogram here anyway, so you know to show hearing loss, right? So the benefits is that you can track um, from when the worker first came to you, I guess, to what is happening now anyway, right? So describe the physical changes in the inner ear and explain the results and effect on hearing for an, for an adult with the following audiogram. So anybody, um, how much participants I have? I didn't see how much people was in class. Um, we have nine persons, right? Anybody could um could say, well, what is this graph show? Because we have discussed audiograms at length anyway. But what is this graph show? What is the condition? Is this aging? Is is this graph aging? Is, um, and or is it something as called? I, I give any all the answers. It is what. Noise induced hearing loss. Very good. It's noise induced hearing loss. Why is it not aging? Um, because noise induced hearing loss, it dips at four and aging dips at eight. Very good. Right. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Remember, I told you now again last week, I didn't have the graph. No, this is not the graph. I did tell you, I saw an old past Um, 2006. I looked back at the video yesterday as I remember it. I said it and they had a graph like this in 2006, and you see how this graph went back up here? Mm -hmm. The graph in the one in 2006, it went back down to the eight, right? So oh. then they like asked students what was happening here. So this is noise induced hearing loss, but then in that other part of the graph, right? Uh, which I don't want to take my, my marker here, but it would come back here anyway. That piece would have been pressed by curses, which is a natural loss of hearing due to aging. So, when they say describe the physical changes in the inner ear, we had covered this a lot. This is in the cochlea of the inner ear. And you have um, tiny hair cells there that would normally convert the sound energy into electrical energy. What is happening here is that those hair cells are being damaged, right? That's what's happening at, you know, the three to the four. Um, this is uh, kilohertz anyway, they have it in K, right? Anyway. But that's what's happening here. And then they say, explain the result and effect on the hearing of an adult employee, uh, which would be like, what, what symptoms would they have now? So the inner ear, it's, it's a two-part question. So the change in the hair cells are being, you know, damaged and, you know, put off or flattened, 
right? Um, but what is happening first and the effect on the person, you can't hear what? Consonants. Consonants, right? Yeah. Consonants. Yeah, so they can hear yeah. vowels, A, I, O, U, but they cannot hear words with S, T, F, right? So anything that's like that, S, sleep, they wouldn't be able to hear that, right? Um, sugar, right? So S, T, F words wouldn't be able to hear, as well as words that have the the S H sound in it, sh, anything that ends with sh, like rush, mm -hmm. anything like that, they wouldn't be able to hear the, the end of it anyway, right? So if you had that, that would have been perfect. And now we come to the little new piece. And I had to do it because I tell you, I know this is not too much. Um, um, accurate representation of the effect of this. That is what this is here. Now, you may wonder, I mean, like, why would they zero down on this um, little paragraph here? It's because right, the reason is that just like the, just like the octave band analysis is a real way of figuring out a type of PE. This is another way of This is another way. If you just look at octave band, see you get a graph, and then you click on a product and you see the same graph. So you know then that, that type of air defender can protect against that kind of noise. This is another way of doing that, right? Um, so I'll take it from here, um, and I'll read first, and I'll probably just give it a formula, right? Now the formula is implied in that little paragraph there, but they did not write the formula out. If you want to see the formula out, you're going to have to look at the guidance, right? I think, like I said, it's probably part six. So the use of hearing protection can also form part of a hearing conservation program, which we know that is like the octave band thing anyway, provided that the correct hearing protection is selected. The employer has selected hearing protection based on the information below. Some pressure level in the workplace, 91 dBc. So automatically what you see here, this technique, the noise have to be measured in dBc, right? And what they have here is uh, in addition to the octave band that is produced with the products, they have something called a SNR number. So the single number rated SNR for the selected hearing protection is 29. And then now they say determine, explain how to determine a realistic es estimate of the A-weighted sound pressure level entering the air of an employee wearing this hearing protection. So a long story short, let me just just break it down, right? So the SNR technique, just keep in mind, is another way, like an octave band analysis to help an employer see like a type of PPE. What you have to take for granted here is that the SNR numbers are already published with the specification of the product. Take a get that? Just like how with the specification of a hearing defender, an octave band has been generated and added to the specification. This SNR number here is also in the specification. So then all you need you need just the decibel sum. However, the decibel here is in dBc, which is a function that the monitors could switch into. The same integrated sum level meters, you can switch the function from dBa to dBc, right? So what is the formula? The way thing here now, if you understand that, so this is like a figure that they'll have to give you. They'll always have to give you this SNR number if they give you a calculation, and they'll always have to give you the dBc rate. And so then how do you now use dbc here and then what they want they wanted to calculate the noise level going to the person a but it's in dba right well the formula is easy what you have to do is minus the two figures so if you wanted to write it you have to say dbc minus snr right dbc minus snr and you have to add four to it. the four oh, is yes. the correction value here right if you read a little paragraph, they have it there, right? So the formula is, I'll say it again, DBC to convert that, that DBC into the DBA, into the person's A. You have to say DBC minus SNR, that's a formula, and then you add 4 to the 4 is like a weighted or a correction value, right? 
So they have it there, if I could read that for you. Um, uh, page 172, the second paragraph, the SNR is subtracted from the C-weighted sun pressure level to give an assumed sun pressure level received at the end when wearing the hearing protection. And then the last, is only, is only eight lines they have, the last two lines, the SNR provided by the manufacturer of the hearing protection already takes account of the standard mean and standard deviation values, but the 4 dB adjustment for the real world factors should still be made. So you have to add 4 dB to get what you call the real world value of the figure, right? So anybody good at math? So you have a your phone, you can just do that. I did it. Uh, I did this last week. Eh? I prepared this here last week anyway. Um, 91 minus 20, then it should give you about 64. But every phone's there, and then you add 40, you're supposed to get about 66. 66. I don't have my 66, right? Yeah, okay, good, right? So that's what they want here. So explain how to determine a realistic estimate, right, of the A weighted sum pressure. And that's when you now, when you put on this. Remember again, I'm telling you, this SNR is a figure published with the air defender, the hearing protection. So the SNR is 29. You measure in DBC, you get 91. You want to know now what is the sound level on the person air while wearing the hearing protection. It's 66 decibels. Anybody knows what that means? Comment on the appropriateness of the hearing protection. Is it good? What in fact is the noise, you know, limit? 80, 85, 87, right? So this thing, when the person have it on, having been exposed to 91 dBC, the only noise hit in the air is 66. Now it tells you that this is a very good type of air defenders, right? Whatever it is they're talking about, the hearing protection, right? However, though, I want to tell you something is, I don't know if it's in the book, right? Um, I want to tell you something is that this hearing protection is so good that they should not use it. I don't know if that's in your book anyway. <laughs> you see on page 170, when they have something called overprotection. Yeah. This thing is created yeah. what they call overprotection. Oh. Right? So I don't know if they'll give you marks or that. I mean, they, it's two marks. You, you say it's suitable. You can say it's suitable because you know you're not, your worker is not exposed to the action limits or the action values published in the control of noise and work regulation. It has not even come close to the lower action value of 80 decibels. However, you're creating a problem here of overprotection. If you want to know how come I come up with that, it's because, like I said, not everything is in your book. In fact, uh, it may be there. But of course, I got some of this from your guidance, right? What it says is that it should give you about 70 to 80. We look at page 171, just the problems of overprotection. And if you come down to the last two lines there, just above selection of hearing protection. Mm -hmm. HSC yeah. recommends that when selecting hearing protection, overprotection should be avoided. You see that? Yeah. And that hearing protection must result, that result in less than 70 dBA, sound pressure level at the A is, Unnecessary. Unnecessary and results in. Over, no, I didn't see the comment on that on this paper, but I just telling you all that there's like a scale in case you want to just write it down, right? I guess wherever you make a note, just write down the scale. The scale is 70 to 80. The scale is anything above 70, then. If you want to say, if you want to take a nice guide of, of, of how appropriate would the Hearing protection B, it should protect you from 70 to 80. But this thing coming on 66. So this is at the way below the 70 anyway. Right? So this is um, what you call overprotection. I did not see it on the exam paper, like I said, but that is the facts of it. Take a little note of it. Right? Let me just draw down to read it for you. Again, you see the passivers take the time, right? Um, I'm just going to read the last piece and stuff, right? So, uh, 
right? But I tell you, I had to do that because uh, and when I was mentioning the calculation theory weeks before, that is one of the calculations I was talking about. One, of course, was the ready reckoner. The other was that one, right? So um, part E, answers to part E. Let me just get the, the mark on that, right? Answers to part E contained inaccuracies with the unit. The unit, when you get the final value, is supposed to be DBA. In fact, it's supposed to be LEP. D, D, B, A, right? So contain inaccuracies and units, with units, sorry, and a lack of appreciation of the correcting, the result of real world factors were common errors. That's added before. Some pressure level entered the air defined in terms of D, B, A, which is what the formula would do, the D, B, A minus, sorry, the D, B, C minus the, N, the, the, the um, S, N, R would give you back the value in D, B, A. However, those candidates, given the correct number with either no units or incorrect units did not gain all the marks available and it was only two marks i think it was anyway right so you see there was no mention there of overprotection or whatever happened but i think it is so obvious that you have to go on to say it right um i mean given the fact that they didn't probably put it in the comments didn't mean that they didn't give the mark for it it would probably go towards your credit Especially if you were able to say that, that it does show, you know, uh, that you are way below the 70 decibels. All right, there's about 15 minutes again, so I'll go into vibration. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think I think what to do. Okay, so the, the, the best thing to do is just to talk about vibration, right? Um, you know, so I'll skip this slide. You know, this is basically what type of equipment generate vibration anyway. Um, so you know from this slide that there are two types of vibration. There's something called whole body vibration as well as hand transmitted vibration. Um, whole body vibration, very common for persons sitting like in a, a, a truck driver, vehicles, you know, if you're standing on a vibrating platform. Um, if you don't know what those things are, most machine shops have them. Uh, most machine shops have people that stand on these platforms for the entire day, right? I did, um, I did work um, many, many years ago, just out of school in a machine shop, IEL. It used to be, but it, they kind of, they didn't really close down, but I mean, they really, they really kind of trimmed down operations anyway, right? And I remember being in these machine shops, if I could describe it, for, but it's a huge machine shop. They described, they, they, they would have made um, pumps and rods for petrotrain anyway, but huge machine shop are talking about and one of the things that was noticeable is that workers would come in in the morning, they would clock their car, they have like a, a plastic car, they would clock their cars, and they go and they stand on this platform, it's like a little, you know, like a platform anyway to stand on, and it's next to a vibrating machine, and for the entire day, except in lunch time and break time, of course, that would be their position, right? So, um, you know, so that workers do suffer whole body vibration, of course, hand uh, transmitted vibration is much more common. Um, I, I'll mention a key term here because I know it's at the end of the slides and I wouldn't get it, but I want to say it because it's important. When you measure hand transmitted vibration, what you have to measure is something called the trigger time. Um, trigger as in a gun trigger, right? The trigger time is the actual time in which the person's hand is in contact with you know, like the moving part of a, not saying the moving part of a drill, but maybe the trigger to the drill, right? So you can have a drill in your hand, but then you might be using it all the time. So when you measure hand transmitted vibration, it's important that they measure something called the trigger time, which is the actual time of the person maybe engaging a button, squeezing a lever or something then, and that will cause the, the machine to come on anyway, right? So... You'll see that, I think, a bit next week. But again, just remember that you must measure. It's not just normally pulling something in your hand, but you measure something called the trigger time. All right? So vibration terminologies, you know, none of the physics ever come. Um, but we could just, I want to mention three pieces of it. So they say vibration is, you know, best described as the oscillation motion to and fro. And um, what it basically means, this slide have it here, it's like a up and it's like a down, right? Um, you know, I had mentioned to you all, you know, I know this of you are like my crazy ideas anyway, but I listen 
but I, I listen to like vibration frequencies then, right? For, for, for many reasons, right? One of us are headaches anyway, right? And they do work anyway. If you go on YouTube, you could find um, like a frequency for anything anyway, for headaches and whatever have you, right? But the point about this is that um, vi like, vi like vibration is what they call an acceleration. If you turn this side, you'll see it. In fact, it's right there. Like what you see is an acceleration and a deceleration. You'll see displacement here. So it's an acceleration and it's a displacement, right? Again, there's no physics involved, but there may be some little things you need to know. So I said there was three, right? So one of them is vibration is the oscillation movement or motion, right, um, of energy then to and through. The other one I think is important is uh, the word amplitude. So you'll see it somewhere on the slides coming up. <coughs> the word amplitude, right? So the amplitude is what they say is the height of the, the height of the curve then, right? So the point from zero to the height of the curve is what you call the amplitude, right? And then there's something called the magnitude. Now why that latter one is important is because the vibration monitor, what they measure is the magnitude. They do not measure the amplitude, but a magnitude, is the amplitude both ways there. So one from zero to the top here is an amplitude, but one entire loop then, one up and one down, makes what you call a magnitude, right? So you can remember that if they say like, what does, I've seen that question before, like, like what does the vibration monitor measure? It's, it's called, by the way, an, accelerom an accelerometer. And what it measures is the magnitude, which is a complete acceleration and a complete, we don't only say deceleration, but if you look at it in maths, they really call it a deceleration, right? But a displacement, a maximum acceleration and a maximum displacement to make one cycle is a magnitude. And if I can go to that slide, just for our exam, the, um, the, the magnitude is measured in something called meters per second squared probably be on the other slide, look at here, right? So the instrument used to measure this is an accelerometer. Units for the acceleration are in meters per second square. You could write that two ways, m, m slash s to the two to the top, or m s to the minus two, right? And you see it right here, this motion from the maximum point, let's get this, the pieces off, right? Um, or a peak in one direction, maximum motion is a usual motion. So the acceleration is peak in the other direction. That is what the magnitude is. an object in accelerably in one direction and then in the opposite direction. So one up and one down. You so have max in the distance CXC max. They call it dB over dt. Um, because the shade of the blues. What I'm to say is that vibration is measured in, well, the accelerometer measures the magnitude and the unit. So that is meters per second squared. Right? So, back to vibration. We have three planes. I have those three planes being x, y, axes, right? That's coming from the other way. Each of the one of or right axis. That is if it doesn't matter if it's an vibration or whole body, they enter the body, vibration enters the body then in three planes, x, y, and z, right? Um... If you're having trouble understanding that, I could use, if you could do your hand like this, but I guess I have to move it up a bit, right? What it says is that um, this represents the three planes, right? If, if your hand represents the three planes, this is one plane, like where your thumb is at. These would be two, and then your arm itself, your hand itself represents the other plane. So you have, if you think of it, this, I guess my hand itself, the arm itself would be the more perpendicular line, which would be the x-axis, right? The one that comes out of it could be the thumb, could be the, the y-axis, and the other one is the z-axis, right? That is just how vibration is. That is what the sound is formed, that it enters the body into, um, not just, you know, like horizontally or vertically, but in three planes anyway, right? And um, same for sitting anyway, the three planes, x, y, and z, 
uh, uh, to me, the only thing you may have to remember this and say is like, you know, um, when measuring vibration that using the accelerometer that it does measure along the X, Y, and Z axes, right? You, it's, it's something that you have to just put onto the person hand or whatever have your whole body if someone is sitting and it does what it has to do in fact it may be simpler than that but you have to remember x y and z why i say simpler for is because your phones do the same thing the cell phone you have does the same mm -hmm. thing if you have us i don't have mine and my mother's son have it playing video games right but I, I mean once you turn your phone you know whenever you turn your phone it turns as well Right, if you're looking at a video and you turn it this way, right, they call it a transducer. It's somewhere on this slide here. So the phones, whenever you see it, right, if you see it, when you read this slide, right? So the accelerometer has a transducer in it that does the same thing in that it simply means whatever direction you change it in, it will change as well and it measures the vibration. They have found that vibration enters the body into those three planes. So the, um, the accelerometer must be able to, me to uh, measure along the three planes as well. All right. Um, so looking at that time, I think if I want to end with something here, um, I'd want to end with, uh, I think we all know the, but not all know, but we should be able to tell some of the vibration effects. We could get into that next week. But if I wanted to end with something good, I'd want to say that you need to know the vibration figures as well. There's a law for vibration that just passed it, right? It's the, it's the sun up in the control of vibration at work regulation 2005. Um, came out the same year with noise, in fact, right? And there's a figure for vibration as well. So the figure for mute vibration, I'm going to have to go down a bit till I find that slide, right? But I know it by heart, right? So what you need to know is for hand arm vibration, the figure is 2.5 and 5 meters per second square. They have um, created an action value and a limit, just like noise. The only exception is that, um, so this is the transducer slide there. And all it says is that they think it measure along the three axes anyway. Your phone has one of it inside of it as well, all right? Um, these things are off the syllabus. This is the old, okay, so this is the slide with the uh, where the figures, where the published limits, so they have an, an action value for hand uh, arm vibration. It's 2.5 and 5. This is easy to remember. The 2.5 is half of 5. The unit is meters per second square. Every time you see a pass paper, they talk about students so don't put the units and they don't see the thing measure magnitude. So that's what I kind of stress on that. For whole body vibration, it's 0.5 and 1.15. So if you come in these two figures to memory, by just knowing these two figures, you would be able to do a passive because they may hint at a passive, but at, um, they measured and they got the figure to be um, three meters per second. Like, like, what does that mean? I mean, those are the kind of questions they actually like. In fact, as I say in that, I don't know if I could spare them, maybe five minutes, I would have just shown you another passive. Um, there was one, there's a way they like to bring this one. Um, I'd have to see where I put that passive now. There's a way they like to bring this one. I'm going to try to direct it to the page in your book, right? So there's also a chart for this. Um, there's also a chart for this, right? Um, it's on page 176. And... Um, Page 176, yeah, right? If I could just show you this one, maybe we can do it next week, right? Um, you can take the year down, those of us who have old passifers, because this is an old one. It's uh, July 2007, right? So just like the noise, there's almost like a chart for this one as well. Um, I'm trying to get my share button up there. And right. So just knowing those two figures, I tell you, is worthwhile to answer possible. Right? Are we almost finished vibration? So next week we'll definitely finish it anyway. And this is the good news for vi for vibration is that a lot of times um what the acts is just like the um the control and the symptoms. So definitely today I'm taking the harder approach. And, um, you know, I'm looking at 
more of the terms and whatever have you, but typically a vibration question can just be like, what are the symptoms of vibration and how do you control vibration, right? Okay, so this, um, the same year I mentioned, like July 2007, you see they give you one here and you see this chart with it. If you look at your book, mm -hmm. I, I closed my book, but page 176, you see a similar chart, right? So it's almost as if, how do you use, I'm gonna probably get my marker for this one. Like how do you use this chart now? to really get an answer out, right? If you want, I can do back piece of this next week anyway. But you say, um, let me go back to the question, sorry. And I've clicked the marker. Once you click these things, they, you have to either use them or don't use them, all right? Um, so back to the table here, let me read first. So question four, a road resurfacing contractor has compiled the following data for two employees who were exposed to hand arm vibration through the use of reciprocated handheld tools. We have Fred Jones using tool A. Uh, measured vibration magnitude there is 16. And what they check here was the trigger time. Uh, you'll find this to be three. Three hours is the trigger time, meaning that his hand is in contact with it three hours. Now, I show my older students know that um, I've said this to you all before. My dissertation at my master's level was on vibration, right? So I, I know. I know um, a lot about this anyway, right? The actual measurement and stuff. So as I mentioned that there is, when you come here, you'll see it. It's not just holding the tool, but it's a time that your hand is actually with, in contact with the tool. Right, we have Bob Smith uh, using tool B. Um, the measured vibration magnitude that they got with the accelerometer is eight, and the trigger time for him is two. So they say using the data above and the graph below, Explain the term exposure action value. Well, that is almost similar to noise. It's the value at which the employer have to take action to limit the limit then, right? That did not reach the limit. So from what we saw before, the exposure action value for hand transmitted vibration, by the way, trigger time is only used for hands. So you're gonna see it here, hand arm transmitted or hand trans hand arm vibration. Um, so this is the value at which the employer have to put measures in place to reduce, you know, the vibration magnitude before it reaches the limit. And you can make reference here to the same figure I told you, the 2.5 and the 5, mm -hmm. right? However, now, but now when you look at this, okay just, just, okay, just remember that we have, let me get back to Mark, that we have 2.5 and 5. That is the limit. So how do we use these figures now? to make that line up to 2.5 and 5. For hand arm vibration, the action value was 2.5 and the limit value is 5, but the answer is the graph. So if you remember these figures, right? I don't want to go up and down with it. So this is 16 and 3 and 8 and 2. So how do you use it? You're going to have to come down to the graph, right? And uh, went a little bit too far there. So what you have to do, I got my marker now, right? So you want to just, Right, so the first one was at 16 and, was it 16? Yeah, was right. 16, 16 and 3? 3? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once, yeah, once you grab the marker, you will be able to, to go back and have to, um, uh, I'll have to go back and take the thing. I think it was 16 and It was 3? Yes, yes, 3. Yes, three. Okay, right. So what you do, you want to get 16 and 3? So that's 16 there. Of course, you probably do this with a ruler, eh? 16 here mm. and 3. And what this will tell you now is what is the actual, you know, um, value there. They measured they got 16 meters per second squared. The time is 3 hours. And what we are seeing, we are falling in the area that it's above the exposure limit value, which oh. we're supposed to know to be 5 meters uh, per second squared. Right? So then when you come back, when I go back to the question, you say, like, what they say, like, what does that mean for, I think it was Fred Jones, like, 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 what does it mean for Fred Jones? It means that the employer have to stop this activity because this is breaching the law. The company here could be fine. Understand that a bit? Mm. Right? Okay. The other one was Bob Smith. I think that was eight and two. Yeah, eight so, and two. That's yeah, eight yeah. and two. So Bob Smith, eight and two. We see that Bob Smith will end up. So Bob Smith now, he is above the action value, but they have not crossed the 
limit value, the actual value is 2.5, right? Mm -hmm. Remember that from the law, 2.5 and 5 meters per second squared. This is a 2 here, right? So 2.5 and 5. So Bob Smith, this is Bob Smith, right? Bob Smith, um, his value is above the actual value, right? It's above the 2.5, but it's, it's below the limit value. So instead of they take action here, this person could keep on working by the way, right? But they may want to do something with the tool or whatever have you, maybe limit the hours, right? Um, you know, to get, you know, a safer figure. But this person could, safe, could safely keep on working with controls in place. This one, they will have to be stopped, right? Um, there's another use of the graph, if you give me five minutes again. There's another use of the graph. There's another use of the graph, right? So you think that's all of it. That's not all of it. There's another use of the graph. This graph could be used to give you the controls. Right? Okay. When they say, if I can read part B there, part B is still here. Explain the most appropriate action that the employer should take for each employee in order to comply with the control of vibration and work regulation. Okay, seven marks, right? So you can go to Tom and talk about, I guess, um, you know, uh, maybe giving the worker gloves, operating at a more consistent speed, cutting down the exposure time. I guess all of those are seven marks, but what I'm saying, the graph could give you an answer, right? Uh, if you want, watch your graph a bit. I'll try to leave those lines there. If, if it gives them a trouble, I'll take it off, right? Because the other solution is some other lines as well. So what you do, if you want to figure out then, this one is Fred Jones, right? At what hour then should Fred Jones be allowed to use that tool? The tool that has created the vibration value of 16. At what hour or how many hours then? So when you say cut down the hours, right? They wanted to use the graph again. How many hours then should he be allowed to use the tool to be safe? And if you watch it, um, um, anybody could see it? At 16, or a he may less than only be able to use the tool for the line well crooked eh, for, <laughs> for half an hour. You see mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. He could only use this tool now for half an hour. Now he would be above the action value, but he wouldn't be crossing the he would be crossing the limit. Limit. So one of the answers you can say Fred Jones could be limited to using this tool here for about 15 minutes or cycles of 15 minutes, in which case it will fall, you know, below the half an hour. Because at half an hour, after he crosses half an hour, he will cross the exposure limit value. See, just, 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 just see if you see that. After you cross the half an hour, then you're going to get into the blue, which is where you mm -hmm. don't want to be. Once you reach here, I mean, remember you're breaching the law, you have to stop the activity, right? So Fred Jones could be his hours maximum have to be half an hour anyway. Think you see that one? Yeah. 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 And uh, I suppose the other person, Bob Smith, eight, um, it's eight and two we have, right? Eight and two. Was it eight and two? Yeah. Eight and yeah. Two. Eight and two. We may have to do almost okay. the same thing for Bob Smith. To bring him within. Um, yeah, to, I mean, to, 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 yeah, I mean, to get him below here, I mean, it really is about the same thing, isn't it? Bob Smith yeah. again is up to half an hour too, right? I mean, if Bob Smith works a half an hour, yeah. he will be safe because he'll be below the, he'll be below the exposure action value. However, though Bob Smith could actually work, you know, Bob Smith could have keep on working in her. Remember, he didn't cross the law. Yeah. Bob Smith could have kept on working till about some way. Well, that line may be crooked, eh? But Bob Smith could have safely keep on working till about some way here, you know? mm -hmm. About three hours and something. That's the maximum, though. This is max, in case you had to give an answer like that. Bob Smith could safely keep on working with controls in place between half an hour and three and maybe um maybe about a quarter hour not quite a half it doesn't seem to be a half right but you understand how to use the graph to get those answers anyway yeah, yeah. 
right mm. that, because that is that is the use of the government let's get back to my normal um, annotation thing here right um let's see the comments the one this one i'll have to clear the screen um, right so the comments i'm just going to go to the last one because we crossed the time already right um Right, so, all right, um, part B, candidates who correctly interpreted the data and the graph provided explain that Fred Jones' exposure was above the exposure limit value, which we did get, and that immediate step, steps needed to be taken to reduce his exposure to that below the exposure action value. This would entail a maximum exposure of half an hour, which an hour. said, right? As for Bob Smith, whilst his exposure is below the exposure limit value, it is above the exposure action value and subsequently his usage time would need to be monitored closely to ensure his maximum time of use stayed at approximately three and a quarter hour, 3.25, and he stayed below the EALV. So that's what I said, he could safely stay between zero and, well, not, sorry, between half, 0.5, half an hour, and 3.25 hours, right? Apart from uh, time of use, other appropriate actions that should have been taken, including replacing the tool with a tool with lower vibration magnitude, you see the word coming in there, ensuring regular maintenance of the tool to prevent an increase in vibration magnitude, Introducing job rotation, considering different methods of work, and this is really next week class. Introducing a sorry health surveillance and training objectives, operatives to recognize the symptoms of hand um, vibration syndrome, um, syndromes. Many candidates did not address the specific issues contained in the question and instead concentrated on general methods concerned with the control of vibration. But again, they I suppose they wanted these figures here. This is where they got these. Sorry, they did the 3.25 and the 0.5. They got those ready from the table itself, right? So I would leave this one. Like I said, we should be on track. Um, next week will be the end of vibration. And then I would probably go to radiation and mus musculoskeletal disorders for the sake of that being the longer chapter anyway, right? Feel free to look at any questions. Um, you know, I would at the end I have another class after in a bit, but Hopefully by the end of today, tomorrow, I would um, post this up on YouTube so you can have a look at it all over again. Any questions from anybody? No. Okay, <laughs> you basically would be the best class to have. <laughs>